we see it now. Excellent. Thanks so much. So it's uh, it's very nice uh, to be invited to give a talk like this. Uh, I really appreciate it, and it's quite an honor to be talking to you. And um, uh, the the message of this technical talk is really something very practical and quite important, I think. It's that uh, simulations are used everywhere and often in engineering, electrical engineering, chemical engineering, science more generally, lots of examples of simulations. But uh, they're very, very, very useful. Uh, but the problem is that since they're often so complicated, um, like, like bunch software, it uh, can create errors. It can give you the wrong results. So that's the main point of the talk. And the good news is that one of the ways, one of the easy, quick ways to address this problem is to use a little bit of mathematics to check the results of the, of the simulation. You might think that this is just checking computer output is a, a boring, uh, technical, dry subject to talk about, but I think that you'll see in the next hour that it can have quite a bit of drama and uh, a lot of emotion and a lot of interesting aspects. So, as I was saying, there's lots of different kinds of simulations. If you wanted to build an airplane like uh, an Airbus or a Boeing airplane or some other kind of airplane, before you spend billions of dollars making factories and uh, creating the actual airplane, it's an awfully good idea to simulate the performance of the aircraft before you ever build it. And this is routinely done by Boeing and Airbus and other uh, companies. Um, absolutely necessary, very good idea. But you don't always want to trust such simulations. You have to test them, check them in various ways. Another very different example of the simulation is uh, the, the pandemic that we're in the middle of. Uh, you can predict the um, incidence of infections and hospitalizations and mortality of COVID-19 uh, mathematically using mathematical models. But again, you can't test these, mo trust these models without checking them. Many other examples of simulations, of course, the stock market, the weather, radar systems, which is my favorite application. If you wanted to design a rocket to go to the moon, you'd certainly want to simulate it. Uh, and the bottom one, which is in red, is uh, multi-sensor data fusion. So now the question is, what is, what do I mean by multi-sensor data fusion? And that's the question that I would like to ask you. What's, what are some examples, maybe your favorite examples of systems or situations in which you would use multiple measurement sensors, multiple sensors to make better decisions, to make more accurate estimates? That's a question for you. Any thoughts? I'm sure that you know many such examples. When Pablo says self-driving vehicles, for example. Yes, that's a wonderful example. Great. Any others? I have another answer in the chat. It says humidity sensors and medical diagnosis. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, so there's actually lots. I listed some here. Humans. We have eyes, we have ears, we have the sense of touch, taste, smell. All animals, in fact. Medical diagnosis, which was just mentioned. Uh, also, I have self-driving cars at the bottom. Um, almost any 
situation that you can imagine where you're trying to make accurate predictions and accurate measurements, uh, including airplanes, uh, is often, very, very often better done with multiple sensors. Humans, it would be hard to get around in the world without using our multiple sensors. So I'd like to, to uh, just to start the discussion of uh, multi-sensor data fusion with a simple cartoon. This cartoon shows two sensors. Uh, there's a red sensor and a blue sensor, and the uh, ellipses are the measurement, the error in the measurement in space that the red sensor makes. Maybe you can think of it as a vision of a bat or uh, an owl. And the blue sensor is some other sensor, maybe the other eye. Each of those animals have two eyes. So you could have the right eye and the left eye, the blue eye and the red eye. And correspondingly, uh, there are three objects, maybe three moths that the uh, bat is looking at or hearing with two of its ears. And of course, if you have two ears, you need to coordinate what comes in the right ear and the left ear. And if you have two eyes, you have to coordinate what comes in the right eye and the left eye so as to be able to combine the data. In your brain, in a human brain, this happens so automatically and so accurately and so well, you don't even think about it. But if you have to have a computer with an algorithm that does this, it's actually not so simple. So the cartoon that I drew is a, an easy case where it's quite easy to associate the blue data with the red data. Three moths, two ears of the bat, and the data association is quite easy. Uh, it's just obvious to you as a human looking at this picture. So um, this simple cartoon applies to many, many other things. It certainly applies to the radar systems that I work on. Um, and uh, so one of the questions that I have for you is, how would you make this problem more difficult? How would you make it more difficult for the compute data fusion algorithm in the computer to correctly associate the data from the red sensor and the blue sensor? Maybe I'll put the cartoon back to uh, help you think about this question. So this is a question for you. I have an answer which says that you can make the problem more difficult by adding movement to the object. Yes, yeah, really good. That's absolutely a terrific reason. Any others? So add more objects. Yes, right. Very good. Any others? Add more parameters that you want to measure. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Any other reasons? Adding uh, disturbs to the system. Say again, I didn't understand that. Adding uh, disturbs. Oh, disturbances. Yes, yes, yes. So there's there's actually a lot of reasons, and uh, a couple of them that I thought of are listed here, and you 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 got uh, some of these, uh, but you could make the measurements errors much bigger. That's item number two. You could add false measurements, false alarms, say clutter. You could you could make the probably detecting the objects smaller so that you're missing some with one eye as opposed to the other eye. You could add biases between the two sensors and you could degrade the sensor resolution. At this point, uh, you're probably not able to guess what I mean by the word resolution. It's different than accuracy, but we'll get to it in a few minutes. It's a very important point. You can imagine with uh, your own eyes, if you couldn't resolve two objects that are close together, then 
you would have a difficult time correctly associating them between your right eye and your left eye. So there's many, many ways to make this problem more difficult. Uh, here's a surprise. Here's something that's really fun, really important, really interesting, and quite a shock to many people. Um, actually, let me just show the simple, normal, theoretical plot. First, this is theory. So if I plotted the error, say position, location, accuracy versus the signal to noise ratio of the sensor, uh, the better the signal to noise ratio, the smaller the error, whether you do fusion or you don't do fusion. But so the, the trends of these two curves, the green and the red curve, are intuitively clear. The error should decrease as you increase signal to noise ratio. But um, what, and furthermore, you could intuitively uh, believe easily enough that if you use more sensors, it's always better. Using more sensors always reduces error or at least never makes it any worse. So, so this little cartoon of sensor fusion is the theoretical uh, picture that we have that using fusion is better than not using fusion. On the other hand, in the real world, surprisingly, amazingly, and very importantly, very often the opposite happens. Uh, it's really a shock, and it's a pretty nasty surprise when this happens. Um, the first time I saw it in the real world, it was uh, painful, actually. Um, if you're an engineer and you design this multi-sensor data fusion system, it could be quite painful, as you imagine. But I have found out over my long career that this is typical. Um, that you get poor performance, you get bigger errors when you use data fusion in many cases. So you probably uh, you probably are shocked by my saying this, and we'll we'll get to the bottom of it. Don't worry. But my question for you is why? Just take a guess. Uh, it's probably an unfair question, as a matter of fact. But still, I'll ask it just to get your mental juices flowing. Uh, why do you think that in the real world, often it's worse to use multiple sensors than just to use one sensor? I have an answer which says that because they don't consider the individual uh, variations of the multiple sensors that we have in the system. Uh, I didn't understand that. The uh, very, could you, could you say it again or say it differently? So, did do you understand that answer, David? That uh, because it doesn't consider the variations in the sensors. Ah, oh. ah, I oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I get it. That's that's that's. That is that is absolutely an important part of what's going and on. Another, another answer says that uh, because of the randomness of the real world. Yes, 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 yes. That's for sure. Unpredictable. Something we couldn't model well in the design. Any other ideas? Uh, I have that because of Adding more uh, sensors, it also adds uh, more parameters that you have to control and measure. Yes, 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 that's that's for sure, that's true. That's right. In theory, though, if we understood, if we could model the situation accurately, that would not by itself make the performance worse. But in practice, it often does make the performance worse. And any other thoughts? So 
I'll uh, I'll spoil the fun by showing you one of the most important. And this 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 is an example of one of the uh, thoughts that you had. Um, here here we have. I'll just show one plot. Here we have a plot of multi-sensor data fusion, and what we've plotted is the probability of correctly associating the objects from sensor A to sensor B. It's like that cartoon that I showed you. We had two sensors, and we had three moths, or three objects. And uh, if the probability is unity for correct association, that's very, very good. We can combine the data from the multiple sensors correctly and properly and get better performance. But if the probability of correct association is low, like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, then often we uh, ruin the performance of the system. So you can see we have two situations. We have the blue curve, which is a, an optimal algorithm, very good algorithm that considers the effect of sensor bias, bias between the two sensors. And the horizontal axis measures the magnitude of the bias. The two means the bias is twice as big as the random error. Four means the bias is four times as big as the random error. And if the bias is four times bigger than the random error, the green curve, which is a suboptimal algorithm, only has about 0.5 probability of correct data association. So the green curve is a very, very good algorithm. It's an optimal algorithm, but it never modeled the possibility of a bias between the two sensors. Now, in a human, in your two eyes, um, uh, human brains are absolutely amazing. Uh, in fact, animal brains are absolutely amazing. They align the um, uh, vision of the two eyes extremely accurately, and we hardly ever notice a misalignment. It would be a disease. It would be a problem. You'd wake up in the morning and uh, your vision wouldn't look right, so you'd maybe go to the doctor or uh, something to try and fix it. But a normal animal, normal human, there is no such bias. But in sensors made by uh, humans, very often there is a large residual bias. So this is one way to ruin, completely ruin data fusion. You design an algorithm that's mathematically optimal, but you forgot to model bias. That's that's one absolutely crucial, um, absolutely crucial, very common problem. And I'll give you I'll give you some references later in the talk to give you more details on the ways to avoid it. Now the next thing I'd like to do is tell you a story. Uh, the story is the story of two companies, Company A and Company B. I will not name Company A and Company B, and you'll you'll figure out later why I don't give them any names. Company A designed a certain sensor, we'll call it sensor A, and Company B designed a different sensor, we'll call that sensor B. And these are two different kinds of sensors. And Company A simulated the performance of the data fusion for sensors A and B. And it did it using a very detailed, very complicated Monte Carlo simulation, 10,000 lines of code, very complicated, detailed. Whereas what company B did was it used a simple back of the envelope formula to predict the performance of data fusion. And company A using its detailed, complicated simulation predicted extremely bad performance of data fusion. It predicted that the probability of correct data association would only be about 10% in a certain situation. Whereas company B, using a simple back of the envelope formula, predicted that the data fusion would be excellent. You'd get correct data association 99% of the time. That's what P is, probability of correct data association. So, um, the, the little formula, the little back of the envelope formula that company B used is given on the chart there. It's just, it's if I computed N, which is the average number of targets within a one sigma error ellipsoid for the data fusion, uh, you just plug that number in and you get the answer P. 
So actually, you can mostly do that calculation in your head. You don't even need an envelope to do the calculation. Um, so th these are this is a big, big, big difference, big uh, discrepancy between these two analyses with the Monte Carlo simulation and the back of the envelope formula. And just for fun, um, which one do you think was correct? One of them, both of them cannot be correct. One has to be badly wrong. Which one do you think is correct? Anybody? Any thoughts? It's a, it would be a wild guess. There's no way to figure it out from what I've told you. Company B is the answer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the story was uh, Company A uh, refused to believe that its Monte Carlo simulation was wrong. So another group, Group C, came in and looked at the code and ran the code and found a bug in the Monte Carlo simulation. You know, in 10,000 lines of code, there's likely to be a bug or two or three or 10. And so months went by, and Company A refused to believe that it's uh, Monte Carlo's expensive, complicated, detailed, beautiful Monte Carlo simulation was giving the wrong answer. And later, months later, it turned out that a third party came in and showed that, yep, it was a bug in the code. When you fix the bug, which was very easy to do, you rerun the Monte Carlo simulation. It gives the same answer as Company B predicted with a simple formula. So this is a little bit like uh, David and Goliath story, where the Goliath is the 10,000 lines of code and the David in the Bible is uh, the uh, simple back of the envelope formula. And this is a true story it would have been an extremely expensive, sad story unless somebody had checked the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, but it turned out to be a, a happy ending. There's the envelope with the uh, simple back of the envelope formula on it, very neatly written out. <clears throat> uh, if you'd like to know where this simple back of the envelope formula comes from, there's a paper. There's a reference to an IEEE paper at the bottom, published 25 years ago. I would say this formula is an extremely useful formula. I've used it many, many times in uh, dramatic, important situations like this. and. Uh, you have any notion of doing data multiple target data fusion, maybe it will be useful for you. So, uh, so the word resolution, I want to talk about resolution now. Um, it's a word that is well known and well understood in optics, say for telescopes and binoculars and even glasses, uh, optometrists. Eye doctors understand the word resolution in the sense I'm using it. But in the sense of um, data fusion, um, sometimes it's not well understood. So I'm just going to try and explain very simply with this cartoon what the word data, what the word resolution means. So at the top, I have two green blobs, and there might be two moths seen by a bat. A bat doesn't have great uh, vision. A, gr a bat has great uh, hearing, but not great vision. And luckily, these two moths are far apart, and the two moths are resolved, meaning the bat can easily tell that there are actually two moths, two moths as opposed to one. But then if the moths move, close, moths move closer together, uh, the bat can still resolve the two moths. The bat can still tell that there are two there, but it's a little more difficult. And then at the bottom, the moths have flown very close together. They're moving around. Uh, and uh, now the two moths are unresolved. They're right on top of each other. It's not, there's no way for a bat or anybody else 
to tell that there are two moths there instead of one moth. So I hope that makes it crystal clear what I mean by the word resolution in this context. So mathematically, for data fusion, we can compute the probability of resolving two objects or resolving all the objects that are there. You could have 10 objects or 100 objects in your uh, uh, in the view of your sensor, your eyes or your ears or something. And um, so this is another simple back of the envelope formula. It gives the probability of resolving multiple objects, where V is the volume of the resolution. And you might think of the volume in the context of this cartoon uh, as, the, say, the area of these green blobs. If the area of the green blobs was bigger than, than V, this resolution volume is bigger. And then lambda is the average spatial density of the objects. So again, uh, related to the simple cartoon, if I had if I put 10 times as many moths in the same area, then lambda would increase by a factor of 10, and things would get much worse. So probably a resolution would get much worse. So you see, I have the two important factors included in this simple equation. I have the resolution uh, quality of the sensor, that's V, and I have the uh, average density of objects, lambda. So that those are the two crucial ingredients to do this calculation. So this is a great simple back of the envelope formula that can be used. And the first way that I'm going to use it is in a analysis of the difficulty of data fusion, multiple sensor, multiple target data fusion. And the way I'll use it is to reach a very important and somewhat surprising conclusion and very simple conclusion. The, con the simple, surprising, important conclusion is that the uh, probability of resolution for any, for any sensor, any kind of sensor, eyes, ears, radars, telescopes, for any situation is always worse. Probably a resolution is always worse than the probability of correct data association. So this is very, very, very interesting because if you read uh, papers published in the IEEE transactions on aerospace and electronic systems on this subject, 99% of the papers focus on data association, and you hardly ever hear of the word resolution mentioned in this context. And yet, if you believe this mathematical result, it turns out that resolution is more important than data association. So this is a result that we computed. It's a mathematical proof. We didn't, we didn't compute it by simulations, although you can easily check it with simulations. We, we uh, prove this result mathematically. And this result is true for any density of targets, for any resolution or accuracy of the sensors, for any kind of sensors, for any signal to noise ratio, for any data. It's true all the time. So I'm going to prove it intuitively for you with a simple cartoon. And the cartoon will be based on this uh, picture that's now, that I showed you uh, about half an hour ago. It's, it just reminds you of the situation that I'm talking about. The situation I'm talking about is uh, here is two sensors, a red sensor and a blue sensor. And I'm talking about three objects. And I'm gonna add a little bit of, uh, I'm gonna add a little bit of information to this picture. And the information that I'm adding is these big blue circles, and that's the boundary of the resolution volume of each uh, sensor. Um, well, in this case, it's just the blue sensor. So the big blue circles are centered on the small uh, blue disks. And uh, any, any two objects within the big blue circles are unresolved. 
That is, you couldn't tell whether there are two separate objects, three separate objects, one object. It's just all a blur. So you can consider those big blue circles as blurs. And uh, on the other hand, the data association that was done um, using the error ellipses, the red ellipses and the blue ellipses, looks like it's uh, excellent quality. It would, you would probably get uh, correct data association 90% of the time. If you plugged in these numbers into my little formula that I gave you a few minutes ago, you'd probably get a 90%, 95% probably a correct data association. Whereas this simple cartoon shows you that in the same situation, you would never resolve these three objects. You would never know that there are three objects there. You wouldn't know that there are three objects, two objects, one object or no objects. And now, now why, why does the resolution volume have the size that I've sketched here? It's because the measurement accuracy, which we'll call sigma, the error, the one sigma error in measurement, is directly related to the resolution by roughly a factor of 10. It's because the normal signal to noise ratio for a typical sensor is roughly uh, 20 dB for a radar, say, a good radar. Um, and if I, 20 dB corresponds to a factor of 100, take the square root of 100, you get a factor of 10. And so you get the conclusion that the resolution, uh, the, the diameter of the resolution blur is roughly 10 times the uh, size of the one sigma measurement error. And that corresponds to this picture that I've just drawn. So if you, um, if you understand the picture that I've just drawn for you, and you understand what these terms mean, it's now absolutely obvious without any mathematics, without any formulas, without anything else, that resolution is a much more difficult problem, always a much more difficult problem than data association. That's the point of that mathematical result that I'm quoting there. Um, shockingly, shockingly, most people who are in this business don't understand that. Um, it's a bit sad, actually, and surprising and shocking to me, even, well, despite the fact that there are papers published and talks given and discussions, but uh, here's another result that sort of is the icing on the cake <clears throat> to reinforce this point. Here's, this, here's the result of Monte Carlo simulation done by, it, this wasn't done by me, this was done by researchers in Germany a few years ago. They did three different kind of simulations. The red one is a simulation where there's no model of limited sensor resolution. That is, however close two objects are to each other, they're assumed to be resolved, perfectly resolved by the uh, simulation. So that's the red <clears throat> curve. And of course, you get the very best performance in that situation. You didn't model limited sensor resolution, so there's no way that you could have any trouble due to resolution. The blue, the blue curve, the blue curve is the curve where the, uh, the simulation did in fact model limited sensor resolution, but we were using an algorithm that was designed to be very, very good in that situation, in the situation of limited sensor resolution. That is the algorithm knew that the sensor resolution was limited. Then the green curve is completely different. The green curve is the situation where the simulation models limited sensor resolution, but the algorithm didn't model it at all. But it was a naive algorithm. It's the algorithm that you would uh, code up and use if you believed 99% of the papers that are published in the IEEE transactions on aerospace and electronics. And as you can see, the errors are enormous. The actual error that you would get with such a system is enormous compared to what you would think it would be in the red curve if you believe the simulation that didn't model 
limited sensor resolution at all. So um, I guess I'll give you a reference to that paper. But what I guess I have a question for you. What what do you take away from all of this? What would you conclude from these stories about sensor resolution? In the chat room, they're saying that it is important to consider the density of objects in the system, and also that uh, it's really important to consider the resolution volume of the sensors that you're going to use in the system. That, that sounds right. That sounds like a really good uh, answer. Can you conclude anything else? Maybe of a different type, different kind of conclusion? Personally, would say that it is more important when you're making the sensor selection that you consider its ability not only to gather information uh, from the environment but also to resolute it. Yeah. Yep. Can't. Yep. That sounds right to me. Uh, I would add another conclusion of a different sort. And this conclusion would be, uh, you shouldn't believe what you read in papers published in the IEEE transactions on aerospace and electronic systems unless you think about it for yourself and maybe think about it from a skeptical viewpoint, from a doubting viewpoint, checking it versus your common sense. After all, it was very easy for me to draw those cartoons that I showed you. and. Uh, if you read a paper that uh, contradicts that simple uh, intuition, there's, there will be problems. So, so far, so far I've talked about all sorts of situations where we have good simple back of the envelope formulas that help us, that help us stay out of trouble, that help us avoid building airplanes that wouldn't fly, that help us build sensor, uh, multiple sensor data fusion systems that wouldn't work. Uh, but um, but there's more work to do. So uh, that's part of the reason that you're going to school, learning about uh, these technical subjects to advance things in the future. So here, I just want to point out that uh, there are big important technologies that we use all the time where we do not have good back of the envelope formulas. We would really, really, really like to have such formulas. And I've just listed a bunch. Um, you've probably all heard about deep learning, so uh, maybe we'll focus on that one. So my question for you is, uh, what is deep learning? Just quickly, just a simple, intuitive, What is it? Answer in the chat it says that it's to model uh, phenomena using data information. And also the ability of an artificial intelligence system to better itself over time. Yes, that's 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 for sure. So it's uh, any any other suggestions about what is deep learning? The capture of several information time. Yeah, right. Um, so it's a uh, for me, it's, uh, it's a very important, very, 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 um, very new, very exciting area. It's, it's a kind of neural net uh, with 
many layers, could have 10 layers, could have 100 layers, could have more layers. And it's all based on the human brain or animal brains. It doesn't have to be the human brain. And uh, one of the researchers who studied the human brain and won a Nobel Prize for it is this guy here. He's looking a little uh, tired, actually. He's uh, Santiago uh, Ramon y Cajal. He was a researcher in Barcelona. And he uh, he's basically the father of modern neuroscience, understanding the brain, the human brain. And he won the Nobel Prize in 1906 for that study. Not only uh, looking through his microscope and drawing very detailed pictures of the neurons and axions and connections in the brain, but also developing theories that correctly explain. So uh, there's a certain kind of deep learning that we do that's explained in this paper that I've got at the bottom here. And uh, we do it using uh, a motion of particles. We transform up the state of knowledge of physical situation from uh, uncertain, the black dots are spread out, so they're more uncertain. We use a law of motion to concentrate the particles using data and experience uh, and uh, information that's collected by the human or the animal or the computer. And the, the information concentrates the uh, knowledge and makes it more uh, precise. So that's represented by those red dots, red particles. So it's motion of particles. It's like physics. We derive laws of motion uh, in order to do this. And this is called particle flow. And it's very, very, very new. And uh, how well it works is something that we're continuously exploring with Monte Carlo simulations. And we think it would be absolutely beautiful if we could have a simple back of the envelope formula that would explain how well we can learn, how fast we can learn in some high dimensional space. D is the dimension of the space. And by the way, in the context of deep learning, in real deep learning algorithms that are really used and have been used for the last 10 years, the dimension of D might be 10 million. 10 million dimensional uh, vector of parameters and dynamical variables. So D is enormous in real applications. So you have to pay attention to D, little d, that is the dimension of the state vector. Uh, little e is the error. It measures the quality of learning, measures the quality of the conditional probability density. N is the number of iterations or the number of particles that you need to describe this probability density. So, of course, the more particles you have, the bigger is N, the smaller is the error. That makes good sense. And the bigger the dimension, generally, the worse the error for a given number of particles. Uh, and uh, so D, epsilon, and capital N make intuitive sense in this simple back of the envelope formula. Let me just blow up the parts that's important. Forget the logarithmic part. Just focus on this uh, first part of this formula. So if I make N larger, you get smaller errors. If I make D larger, you get bigger errors. But then there's other stuff in this formula. Uh, there's a kappa. Kappa is the condition number. It measures the numerical ill conditioning of a certain big, ma huge matrix in this calculation. And capital D is the initial error, the initial uncertainty. It's what you know when you wake up before you looked at any data. And so this is a like a magical formula for us. This is a beautiful formula that popped up in a paper that we found a couple of years ago. And it was created by uh, a research group in California led by Michael Jordan. Of course, you all know that Michael Jordan is a basketball, famous basketball player, but that's the different Michael Jordan. This Michael Jordan is a professor of computer science at Berkeley 
University of California at Berkeley, and he's a lot shorter than the basketball player. Anyway, there's a lovely video that you can uh, find online for free of a talk that Michael Jordan gave on the subject uh, just about one month ago. It was a talk that he gave at Princeton, and the second part of his talk was all about this formula and this analysis. He's all excited about it. So why am I excited about it? I'm excited about it for the reasons given in the red box. Firstly, this formula doesn't require you to take the limit as the number of particles goes to infinity. For me, that's an impractical mathematical simplification, mathematical idealization that's of no practical value whatsoever. That's called an asymptotic bound. Uh, that's the kind of bound that's in almost all statistics papers or statistics books. Uh, it's the kind of bound that's easier to derive, whereas this bound is different. This is for a finite n. You could have n of 1, and this bound would still make good sense. Second, so it's it's absolutely positively necessary to look at non-asymptotic bounds. That's first and foremost. Secondly, is there explicit numerical values in this bound, like 52 or 24? In fact, those are the only two uh, specific numerical values. Uh, whereas most theory in books and papers you'll find on the subject uh, just call the, the constant C, and don't ever tell you what the numerical value of C is, because the researchers don't know what the value of C. Whereas here, Professor Jordan and his colleagues have very nicely computed the explicit numerical value of the constant. Thirdly, <clears throat> this formula includes all six ingredients that are important to understand the problem. The accuracy of the density, the dimension of the problem, the initial error, capital D, the number of particles, capital N, uh, and M, which I haven't mentioned, is the minimum eigenvalue of the uh, Hessian of partial derivatives of the logarithm of the conditional density. So I absolutely love this uh, result. And uh, maybe you, well, an, a second reason that I love this result is that it uh, solved a puzzle that we had for one year. We were scratching our heads for a whole year after we had done some Monte Carlo simulations. And the curves that I'm plotting here, uh, which is error versus number of particles, we couldn't understand them at all. This is the result of our particle flow that we invented to be used in nonlinear filters and deep learning. And we were getting these uh, very strange results where if you increase the initial error, say to 10,000, you get a huge error with just a few particles. Whereas if you decrease the initial error, capital D, the, the final error became much less. And we thought this was a bug in our code, or it was a defect in our algorithm, or we were doing something else wrong. But lo and behold, Michael Jordan's theoretical bound, which I show there in this nice green box, uh, explained exactly what was going on. And it turns out our Monte Carlo simulation was correct. The numerical values coming out of our Monte Carlo simulation were right. So if you wanted to learn about what I'm talking about here, uh, you, could, you could, if you wanted, do two things. There's a video. Here's the video. Um, you probably don't want to memorize or copy down that uh, alphabet soup is there. But um, I, I gave uh, you the charts for this that you can look at after the, <clears throat> and you can refer to this uh, website. Or you can just Google my name for a video and you'll find it. And then also there's a paper that summarizes the theory and the numerical results. So in the remaining time, in the remaining few minutes, I just want to uh, point out yet another some triumph of the simple back of the envelope formula. 
here's a completely new field of radar it's called quantum radar. You've probably heard about quantum computers, which promise to be able to compute things enormously faster than normal computers. Uh, and we don't actually, my company builds quantum computers, uh, working with IBM and MIT and other researchers around the world. So we have a, we have a uh, deep interest in quantum computers. And you've probably also heard about quantum communication. Oh, by the way, quantum computers, rumor has it, uh, have the potential of breaking all the top secret codes that are used everywhere around the world and exposing the top secret messages that are in those, in those uh, communications. So people are very, very worried, very interested, fascinated, in fact, by the novelty and power of quantum computers. And you've probably also heard of quantum communication, but I would bet that you've probably never heard of quantum radar. And uh, it's very new, it's very interesting, fascinating in fact, amazing, difficult to understand, except when you, after you read this nice paper that I've listed here by um, Seth Lloyd and Jeff Shapiro, Barris Erkman, a uh, whole team of people from Italy and MIT published in 2008, giving these two beautifully simple, accurate back of the envelope formulas to predict the probability of detection targets for a quantum radar. That's what I call P of QR, probability of detection for a quantum radar, and a corresponding formula for the probability detection for a classical radar. That is the best, the optimal non-quantum radar, the best boring old non-quantum radar. And you'll notice that these two formulas are very close. They have mostly the same terms in them, except for the factor of four. And the factor of four makes all the difference in the world. The factor of four means that the quantum radar would be better uh, in an exponential way by that is the exponent is four times better. So this is, in a, for a radar, this is 60 B. Factor of four is 60 B in signal to noise ratio, which is enormous, very exciting, very interesting. And um, if you were to build a quantum radar today, you would need one of these uh, enormous, expensive, complicated refrigerators that I show on the right. This is a machine that was built uh, at a company called Janus Research, which is located about 10 minutes from my office up here in Boston, Massachusetts. And with all those wires and all those gizmos and liquid helium and liquid nitrogen, and this device cools, cools uh, uh, superconducting devices down to seven millikelvin. Uh, way cooler than liquid helium. So this is enormously cold uh, and that's what's needed. Otherwise the thing doesn't work. Anyway, a triumph, absolutely a triumph of, uh, a triumph of simple back of the envelope formula. So where did this formula come from? Where did this, uh, okay, so I have two formulas, two very simple back of the envelope formulas. They're enormously useful. They predict great performance improvement in a very simple way. But where do they come from? They're both what are called Chernoff bands, uh, invented by Herman Chernoff about uh, 70 years ago, long before all of you were born. Not quite longer ago than I was born. Um, and a Chernoff bound is uh, this uh, complicated mess that you can see at the top of the screen. This is integral, how do you do that? Doesn't look like good news, doesn't look easy, doesn't look like a simple back of the envelope formula. But the very, very good news is that if for special densities, for special probably densities, like Gaussian densities, densities from the exponential family, other specific uh, 
dice densities like that, we can numerically evaluate this integral very easily. Or if you want, you could just read Tom Kylath's paper. Beautiful, simple, uh, one of the best papers I've ever read in many, in my many, many long years of practicing electrical engineering. And as I say, it's, uh, it's incredibly useful, not just for quantum radars. Another, another incredibly useful result that is used to create back of the envelope formulas is called the Cremer Rao bound. Uh, and again, the bound that I've written there looks sort of like a mess. It's a bound on a matrix. It's a lower bound on a matrix. It's a covariance matrix of errors in estimating X. And estimating X say, in a radar is uh, crucial for us. That's why we build radars to begin with. And um, you might look at that and it might not be a very friendly equation. The second derivative with respect to X of the logarithm of the probability density of the data, Z conditioned on the state factor. Then you have to invert the matrix. That's what the minus one means. Uh, but it becomes more friendly when you specialize it to Gaussian densities. In fact, if you plug in any Gaussian density in for P, you'll get that this bound is exact. That is, the C on the left is exactly equal to the covariance matrix of the Gaussian density. Because the Gaussian density is uh, something times E to the minus a half X transpose C inverse X. And uh, if you go through the simple calculation that I just ported out, you'll find out that uh, C is equal to C. That's what the Kramer bound tells you. So the Kramer bound is exact, is it's tight. It's not just tight, it's exact in the case of a Gaussian density. And they, in the case of a much bigger family of densities, the exponential family, it's also exact. So this bound, which is easy to compute, is, uh, is exact in many, many cases of practical interest, cases where we can actually compute things. So it's I, I, basically, I, in addition to it being easy and useful, I, I just love the Khmer Rao bound as uh, a mathematical object. And I've spent many decades generalizing it. There's a little, there's a little paper that we wrote that generalizes it to expand the situations in which you can use it. It's like putting uh, snow tires on a car. I guess, I guess in El Salvador, you don't use snow tires too often. But I'll tell you that in Boston, they come in handy. So that would be what I think of as a generalization of the car. And uh, maybe with that, oh, I have a, another question. So this is the last question I have for you. And I feel it's sort of an important question. Um, what would you do if you had a simulation and you would like to explain it, but you didn't have a simple back of the envelope? What, how would you proceed? What would you do? Uh, I have an answer that says that you would have to assume some parameters. Yes, you would definitely have to make some assumptions. Any other thoughts? Also, I think that you would have to use some more, way more complex mathematical and scientific methods to have an explanation for your simulation. Yes, that's for sure. That's that's a good, very, very good answer. Any other any other thoughts about what you might do? You didn't have a simple back of the envelope formula. It, uh, I have another answer that says that you may try to research for one uh, explanation that suits your simulation. Yes, that sounds right. That sounds. Right. In addition, you can do uh, real physical experiments. 
like you could go off and build a quantum radar, or you could go off and build a quantum computer, or you could go off and build the airplane, although that's an awfully expensive, uh, risky thing. That's what the Wright brothers did. That's what people used to do in the old days. They would just build the airplane and fly it, and uh, uh, that's why test pilots are awfully brave. They were certainly brave in the old days, and they're still brave today. Um, but it's an awful lot easier and better to be doing simulations or mathematical analysis to be checking this. So with that final question, uh, I thank you for your attention. And uh, I thank you for your uh, good answers to these uh, questions. And uh, if you would like to ask me questions, that would be great. Thank you, Mr. Frederick, for your valuable contribution. And now we will begin with the questions and answers section. Great. So uh, to the audience, if you have any question, please write your full name to the chat room. So we give you the word by activating your microphone, or you can also write your full question in the chat room so I can read them to Mr. Frederick and he will answer them. couple questions already, so I'll, I'll read them to you one by one, and you can answer in between uh, questions, Mr. Frederick. Good. The first question comes from Gustavo Sandoval, and he asks, which books would you rec recommend if I wanted to learn more about deep learning? So um, there's a... Uh... Well, actually, I don't like any of the books, to be totally honest. Um, you could pick you could pick up some books, but uh, what I th what I think is a better approach is to listen to the uh, lectures, the video, the free video lectures at the uh, neural conference called NIPS. Neural Information Processing NIPS. It occurs every December, every year. Uh, last year it was in Vancouver, um, and uh, I think next year it'll be in Vancouver. It's a huge, important conference, and it includes it includes tutorial talks. It includes talks at the very basic level of uh, introducing students and researchers to uh, deep learning and it goes to uh, also has many talks at the very cutting edge of research so i would say that's the best and it's free you just log on to the internet do a google search for nips and you'll find the videos free videos there's there's uh, thousands of them and of course you'll have to use a little judgment and imagination and hunting to find ones that you love, but to say, um, oh, um, the, uh, the plenary talks, the talks that are for everyone in the whole conference are typically a way to start. And uh, I think those are much more valuable. Um, I would say there aren't, I mean, um, I mean, the big fat book that was published about three years ago, which is entitled uh, Deep Learning. Yeah, that's sort of the Bible, but actually I don't like it. Um, <laughs> in fact, I don't like most books for most subjects. Uh, there's something about it. That it it's just it's hard to get a f real feeling for what's going on by uh, reading such books. Sorry. Thanks for the answer, uh, Mr. Dom. And the next question comes from Eduardo Medina, who says, how can you start to learn and understand the multi-sensor data fusion in order to apply it on something? And he's got another question too, which uh, says, how do you apply deep learning to a radar? Great. 
Um, so the first question is, uh, uh, if I was a student at Universidad Don Bosco, I would build, uh, I would build a real physical thing that had multi sensors. That would be the best way to really learn fast and well. Um, like I know up here, some schools, they have contests of uh, the students build soccer playing or football playing robots. So build a robot that would move and move around a soccer ball or football or anything like that. And uh, they, they don't have feet and eyes and hands, and, but these robots are just, you know, sort of little trucks that are uh, electrically controlled, radio controlled, build or, or build something even much, much simpler, build some, some thing that makes use of multiple sensors. So uh, in the case of the soccer playing robot, the first sensor you think of is uh, a little camera, a little camera like as in your cell phone or your smartphone. So they're very, you could, you could use your cell phone if you didn't mind it getting in trouble <laughs> so just do or else or else simulate but i think building a real physical thing even very simple very cheap just very uh would be a good really good exercise next best thing would be to write a computer program which would simulate the performance of a multi-sensor data fusion system uh but that's not as good as building a real physical thing and then the third thing you could do is read papers and books. But again, you know my opinion of books. <laughs> you might be able to find a good paper, uh, and I do have good papers that are referenced in these charts earlier. So the second question that you asked about how you would use deep learning and radar, um, there are many, many, many ways to use deep learning and radar. I'll just give you a few examples. Um, first, um, say you're building a radar which is trying to track aircraft to help the aircraft land at an airport, and there are also birds like um, geese, vultures, pigeons, grackles, seagulls, all sorts of birds. There can be thousands and thousands of birds around an airport, and there are. And the, the radar needs to be able to tell the difference between little aircraft that are moving not too fast and they're not too big from flocks of birds. And you can imagine a flock of geese or a flock of turkeys or a flock of vultures or seagulls to a radar might look a lot like an airplane. Um, so telling the difference between these is a crucial task, important task. So um, we have algorithms that can do that, that we designed 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. We keep getting better. But the, we don't think they're nearly as good as what you could do with deep learning, where the computer basically teaches itself by examples. Show the computer... Uh, many, many examples of real data and allow the computer to learn by itself. Um, we think that's a better approach for the future. Actually, I don't know of anyone who's actually done this successfully and well yet, but that's one example. Thank you for the answer. Now, uh... Um, Juan Pablo Moreno Vega wants to ask a question personally to you. So, Juan Pablo, your microphone is going to be activated by the host, and you have the word to talk to talk to Mr. Frederick. Uh, okay, thank you, David. Uh, Mr. Frederick, my question would be: if you have any open software that you would recommend for maybe basic engineering simulations. Maybe if you don't have any open software, what software would you recommend for basic engineering simulations that a student could use for, for basing his projects on, his real-life projects? 
So there's many different kinds of engineering projects and uh, one kind of uh, engineering project would be about the multi-sensor data fusion that I was talking about. Uh, if you wanted software for that, there's very nice open software, which is called Stone Soup. Stone Soup. Uh, it's created in uh, England, but people from all over the world contribute to it. For example, you could contribute to it. People contribute their algorithms uh, to it. So Stone Soup is one example. You, you could just do a Google search for Stone Soup and add a few extra words like uh, multi-sensor data fusion or tracking or Kalman filters or something. And if you can't find it, just send me an email. I'll be delighted to help you. There's another piece of software like that that was created by uh, the Naval Research Laboratory in the United States that David Krauss wrote. It's full of <clears throat> beautiful, useful, accurate, well-documented um, algorithms, and it's open, um, and uh, it's free and contacting him. Uh, if you can't find him, uh, again, send me an email. And, you know, in terms of general purpose open software, open open software is, is, is very, very nice to have. <clears throat> uh, it's actually not even clear how you would define it precisely, because different people define openness differently, but also the openness creates problems. Um, so you might consider good software that's useful and free, but isn't open. Sometimes that's better. In fact, in my experience, often it is, it is better. It's controlled, um, so the quality is, could be higher, the accuracy, the documentation, documentation could be higher. It's just a thought. I mean, open is wonderful if it's if it works well for you, but open open sometimes is, is a difficult uh, uh, to ask for. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the answer. And uh, we continue with more questions. Uh, it's Ricardo Cortez turn and he is asking how is a quantum computer composed in general terms sorry how is a quantum computer what composed or what are the elements that uh, ah okay uh, very good so in a quantum computer we have qubits q for quantum and these qubits are connected to each other uh, and one qubit affects another qubit and uh, it's very unlike a conventional computer, which just has bits. Uh, bits, of course, are used in combinations, in words in computers, and bytes, of course. You might have 64 bits all hooked up together to make a single word to do arithmetic, 64-bit floating point arithmetic. But uh, these bits don't really interact in a conventional computer, whereas in a quantum computer, the qubits do interact. In fact, you can't even describe the state of one qubit without describing at the same time the state of the other qubit. You cannot describe one qubit in isolation. You have to describe the state of all qubits jointly. And basically, uh, you for certain special kinds of calculations, um, the fact that all of these qubits are interconnected means that you get an exponential speed up in the calculation. Uh, in particular, all of the qubits are doing uh, all of the calculations simultaneously. So the state of the machine is a superposition of all the possible numerical answers. So if you had, uh, say, um, 10 billion possible answers, a conventional computer 
would go through one possible answer at a time. And so it would take a time corresponding to 10 billion calculations. Whereas the quantum computer can do all 10 billion calculations all at the same time. Now, it turns out that only very special problems are of this type where you can exploit this parallelism of the quantum computer. But one, one, one example of a problem like that is breaking top secret codes, which is why people are extremely worried, extremely interested, and in spending lots and lots of money on trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, by the way, you have to cool these qubits to uh, seven millikelvin, seven uh, millionths of a degree Kelvin, much, much, much colder than liquid helium. Very, very special super duper refrigerator is needed. The next question comes uh, from Eduardo Medina, and he is asking uh, if you think it's possible to apply a multi sensor data fusion for an aircraft maintenance facility to improve productivity? And how would you do it? Yes, absolutely. Um, in fact, my company does that. My company is uh, Raytheon Technology. Uh, we, we just uh, combined one big company called Raytheon with another big company called United Technologies. United Technologies does maintain aircraft, and uh, United Technologies, in fact, does exactly what Eduardo is asking about. And we definitely use multiple sensors, uh, multiple information, multiple data. Uh, you, for example, uh, you would want to know where everything is. You would want to know physically where the parts that get put together to do the maintenance are in order to uh, do the maintenance efficiently. And if you're running out of parts, like if you're running out of propellers for your airplanes, you better order some more if you expect to do effective maintenance. Secondly, uh, measure the efficiency of the maintenance uh, that's been going on uh, with sensors. Uh, measure how long it takes to do the maintenance from the beginning to the end. And furthermore, measure how uh, effective the maintenance was. Maybe somebody finished the maintenance and put a stamp of approval on the airplane and said, okay, we'll ship the airplane out and we'll have it fly, but in fact, the maintenance wasn't effective. Very, very, very important to understand what's going on. So you need multiple sensors, both on the airplane and as well as off the airplane in order to measure the actual uh, state of the aircraft that you maintain, as well as state of the parts, like the engines. We, by the way, we build aircraft engines and other parts of aircraft. So this is crucial for us. So I think that's an excellent question that Eduardo asked. 